Let's implement context switch. All right, shown here is Jesus not of context switch. So first of all, this thread switch requires two TCBs. This is a type struct TCB, old thread and new thread. So obviously this is outgoing and this is incoming thread. So before calling this function, the current thread is outgoing thread. And after the thread switch call, the current thread becomes this incoming thread. And obviously, uh, you have to use uh, assembly uh, because uh, you have to actually manipulate stack. The code is not written in formal inline assembly, but we don't have to be exact. First of all, it starts with saving all registers by pushing to old stack. And then you save the current stack pointer to the SP member of this old outgoing threads TCB and you update the ESP stack pointer register of the CPU at this point by this statement. Uh, you update this ESP register, stack pointer register with the, the, the stack pointer value of the incoming thread and then you perform pop all double. So restore register by popping from new stack. You don't actually require this push all the pop all the, but this amounts to saving the current register to somewhere. So in previous discussion, the TCB had this uh, member fields of all the registers. That's one way. Another way is to save current register to the current top of the stack. Okay, this is another way. Let's examine this a little bit further. Uh, in the beginning, before thread switch, let's say you have stack. So this is a stack for old thread, outgoing. And this is the stack of new thread. Obviously, in the beginning of the context switch, this is the current thread. And we assume that stack grows downward. And new thread stack has some values like this. And at the beginning, the current stack pointer you have a CPU. CPU has stack pointer, register, ESP. At the start of this assembly code, the stack pointer is pointing to the top of the stack. Actually, x86 convention, the top is always filled. So it's like this. So these regions are empty, and this is a filled. So right now, we are about to call this push AD. And this is the instruction that pushes all registers to current stack, you know, right here. So ESP is pointing at this location right now. So the outcome of push AD, you save all these register, EAX, EBX, whatever registers the push AD pushes, it is pushing all the registers. And the stack pointer is updated, it's pointing to the new top of the stack. Before, it was pointing here, but this is a result of push AD. This is outcome of first instruction. The second instruction, and you save the stack pointer value to PCB SP field. Uh, let's say there's a SP field in TCB. Something like this. And you have this old thread TCB instance, you have SP field. And at this moment, this SP field will have the current ESP value. So let's say the address of this location, the top of the stack currently pointed by ESP is 0x12345670. Then SP value will be updated with 0x12345670. This is what it means. The next step here, this is a, the most important step in the context switch, updating the stack pointer. So basically, you 
change this ESP register content with the SP value from this new thread, the incoming thread. So obviously, this means the TCB of this new thread, SP field, has, let's say, 0x, a, b, c, d, 0, 0, 0, 0. This means that the stack pointer will be updated with this value. And obviously, we know that this was saved. This A, B, C, D, 0, 0, 0, 0 was saved to SP when last time this new thread was scheduled out and saved just by this process. So this implies that the address of the top of the stack of this new thread TCB is 0, X, A, B, C, D, 0, 0, 0, 0. So we are now executing this third instruction. So ESP should point to this location here. And then you execute pop all double. Because we know that this new thread was previously scheduled out using the same process by executing the same sequence of context switch code, we know that top of the stack is saved registers, the frozen content of the register file. That means by executing pop AD, you're essentially restoring all this saved register back to CPU. Okay, so after executing pop AD, the CPU will have restored the content of the registers of this new thread. Pop AD actually pops all the register. So after popping, stack pointer should point to here. And that implies you consumed all the content of the top of the stack. And the stack pointer is pointing to the top of the stack when the new thread was scheduled out last time. You may wonder, so what kind of content this part of the stack should have? This should have all the local variable and also function return pointers. Essentially, the, the context of the thread. So in conclusion, by switching stack pointer along with saving all the register content, it can essentially switch from one context, including all the local variables and return pointer, to the another context. This is one set of execution state of the outgoing thread, and this has the state of incoming thread. So by switching the stack pointer, we can actually stop being myself and start being somebody else. And most operating systems more or less use the same strategy. It all comes down to switching stack. The name of this context switch code is thread switch. And we are going to use this thread switch code to implement this thread yield function. So what is thread yield? Uh, if you're executing some code and you're being nice, and you ask the scheduler you want to yield. Doesn't guarantee that somebody else will execute as a result, but it's basically you calling scheduler, okay, hey, I just want to be nice. If you have something else to execute, I'm going to yield and let other, if there's any, let other threat have a chance to execute. And obviously this has to involve context switch. As you can see, this code will call thread switch that we implemented earlier here. Thread, this is the same code. And before we do this, uh, we need to pick which thread to execute next. So reminder, thread switch needs two parameters. The first one is outgoing thread. And the second one is incoming thread. So the first one, you need to supply the TCP of yourself. And this code use this symbol or variable I should be very careful uh, this symbol called the running thread to represent the TCB of yourself the thread that is running right now okay so running thread is a type of TCB 
and also you need chosen TCB. So this is the incoming thread. And you need to take a look at the ready list to obtain this chosen TCB. As you can see, you have this right here. So ready list and calls get next thread. I don't have implementation of get next thread here. You can just assume that ready list is a list container. And by calling this, it will give you available item. And if the ready list is empty, then nothing has to run. So go back to running the original thread. So it's just a fall through and it performs some kind of additional cleanup action, which is somewhat unrelated to this thread yield, but it's still there. I'm going to come back to this. If ready list gives you a TCB, then you need to switch. So before you do that, make sure you change your state to ready. We are not blocking, therefore it shouldn't be waiting, but it's just already, okay? And then we put ourselves to the ready list, okay? And then call thread switch call. And then you change the state of the current thread to running. So this is important. Before thread switch, the current thread, the running thread, is the outgoing thread. And after thread switch, the current thread becomes the incoming thread. So the running thread here refers to the TCB of the incoming thread, the chosen TCB here. So we are changing the state. We already finished the context switch, so we are now switching the state to running state. So at this point, I should ask you a question. What is this running thread? So it is a type of TCB, okay? But nowhere in this code manipulated the value that's referred to by this running thread symbol here. Okay, this is a very interesting object here because if this was uh, just a regular variable like this, chosen TCB. This running thread is a piece of memory that contains a pointer to a TCB. And at this point, the pointer is pointing to the outgoing thread. And magically after this, this running thread pointer is now pointing to the chosen TCB, a different one. But nowhere in this code, we changed the pointer. What is going on? So this is a big question. And we are going to uh, come back to this later once we talk about all the context switch code in detail. We are almost done analyzing this thread switch and thread yield code. And after this, you do this some kind of clean up action here. So what this is, we are trying to clean up all the thread that's in finished state. So we assume that there is a, a list of finished thread. Just because we just entered part of the scheduler code, we took this opportunity to delete all the pieces of memory assigned to finished thread. A little bit unrelated. Okay, so you can easily see that this code is very, very sensitive, very critical part of the scheduler code. And obviously, nobody should interrupt. If somebody can interrupt this, and as a result of the interruption, somebody actually tries to schedule again, everything will break. So it is very important to make sure that this never gets interrupted. Uh, in a sense, this should be atomic. The execution of this you know, segment of code should be done in atomic fashion. We are going to study this later, but one way to ensure the atomicity of this is to disable interrupt. You basically disable source of interruption. And this disable interrupt and enable interrupt actually creates a rudimentary critical section by means of disabling any source of asynchronous event. And also, we are assuming, not only just x86, we are assuming here our underlying hardware has just one CPU, uniprocessor system. So if this is a multiprocessor system, you have to care about 
presence of other CPUs. And essentially, you have to use a spin up as well. But here, we are assuming that the underlying hardware is uniprocessor system. And we're going to talk about different nuances between uniprocessor and multiprocessor system in near future. All right. So the textbook has this scenario. So textbook has an example where you create two threads that execute the same code. They both execute this thread yield function. And this is the interleaved scenario of thread one and thread two. And over here, this is a sequence of processors instruction. So I will leave it to you to go through these examples. And the big picture here is this context switch allows this transparent time slicing and time sharing. So from the perspective of thread one, nothing happens except for between this thread yield and return from thread yield, it takes a long time, but uh, because thread one essentially uh, zoned out, has been frozen for millions of clock cycles, then uh, later you came back to life and start executing, just you know, nothing happened. But uh, in, in real world, uh, the CPU, you know, there's a lot of things going on here. So that's the magic and the stack switching is the underlying trick that enables this scheduling and context switch magic. All right, what about uh, creating a thread? So this is the outline of what should happen when you want to implement thread create call. So basically you allocate a new TCB and allocate new stack for this thread and you set up the memory for the initial jump and put thread on the ready list and this thread will eventually be picked up by the scheduler sometimes later or maybe right away. Because of the way we perform the context switch like this and context switch code requires the top of the stack to be filled by this saved register, the part of the thread creation needs to be the preparation for the initial stack frame. And this code implements that part of the code. So it's a new thread, the top of the stack, first update with the address of the stop, and you decrement the stack pointer, and you make uh, room for the initial pop AD call. Uh, once you prepare initial stack frame like this, then you can just throw this new thread into this pool of ready list. And the next time it gets picked up, the scheduler code will just use the same context switch code and it will jump into the first code correctly. 